Good evening. How are you? Good? All right. Thank you all so much for coming back tonight for round two. Amen? Okay. Hopefully we'll have just as much fun tonight as we did last night, maybe even a little bit more. Now that we know each other and we're a little relaxed, we can uh, enjoy the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and growing in the knowledge of our faith. To start off tonight, I will do what I forgot to do last night, unfortunately, and that is pray. <laughs> I forgot to start last night with a prayer. It was brought to my attention afterward. Uh, I have a methodology where I normally start by introducing myself and kind of breaking the ice, then I start with a prayer and then go into the reflection. But I got so hyped up last night, I was so excited. I forgot about the prayer. <laughs> so let's go ahead and pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Repeat after me. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of the faithful. And kindle within us the fire of thy love. O Father, send forth your Spirit. And we shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your consolation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we all say together, Amen. Saint Marcellus, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So we're coming off of our first session, answering the call to evangelization. If you recall last night, we answered the question, what is evangelization? Understanding that evangelization is the proclamation of the Evangelion, that is the good news of Jesus Christ. Understood in the narrow sense as the proclamation of the good news to the unbeliever. Understood in a broad sense. Anything that we do to try and permeate the human experience with the gospel of Jesus Christ is indeed evangelization. And we even talked about the new evangelization, which is basically evangelizing the sacramentalized, right? The audience of the new evangelization are the baptized members of the mystical body of Christ. Those baptized members, those baptized Christians, who either A, have lost the fervor of faith, lost the zeal of love for Jesus and Holy Mother Church, or B, those who have simply never been evangelized, who've never had the flame of love enkindled within their heart, although it was given to them in the sacrament of baptism. That's the new evangelization. Trying to lead the Catholic people to rise, to get them to rise up, to get them out of lukewarmness to deliver our Catholic people from the, the vice of acedia, which is spiritual laziness. That's what the new evangelization is all about. Then we spoke about what is the gospel that we're supposed to be evangelizing with. And we understood that gospel, that evangelion of Jesus Christ in light of both the Jewish tradition and the Roman tradition. And in light of those two traditions, we get a clearer picture in summarized form of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Then we looked at seven obstacles to evangelization. Certain stumbling blocks for us as Catholics that keeps us from achieving the mission of evangelization that Christ gives us by virtue of our baptism and confirmation. And then we looked at eleven reasons why we must evangelize. It was the mission of Jesus, the mission of the apostles, the nature of the church, and on down the list, culminating with love. We evangelize for the sake of love. The love of God, 
and the love of neighbor. And even love of self because as we saw, evangelization, that spiritual work of mercy, is a criterion for our salvation. We will be judged based upon how well we attempt to live up to the mandate to evangelize. Tonight, tonight's session is entitled Cultivating the Heart and the Mind for Evangelization. If we have this mandate and this call to go out and evangelize, we need to learn how to prepare for this apostolic endeavor. Just like in the army, you don't just take somebody and throw them out on the battlefield, you bring them to boot camp, right? They have to get prepared. They have to learn the techniques. They have to learn the tools, receive the tools that they need in order to be effective on the battlefield. Well, the same is true for us as Catholics. We need to go to evangelization boot camp. So, evangelization boot camp is now in session. Amen? So, tonight's going to be obviously divided into two major sections. Cultivation of the heart and cultivation of the mind. Now, at the end of tonight's session, if you walk out of here and you say, man, he, he kind of emphasized the cultivation of the mind more so than the heart, that would be a correct judgment, okay? Because I will emphasize the cultivation of the mind a little bit more tonight simply because not to negate the importance of cultivation of the heart, although that is primarily the prime important thing, but my training is in theology, that is dogmatic theology, in apologetics, in philosophy, so I tend to emphasize the intellectual aspect of our faith at times, because that's just simply what I'm trained in. Unfortunately, I haven't had much training in spiritual theology in a formal way, in order that I can articulate that aspect of preparation for evangelization like I can the intellectual side. So what I want to do tonight is go through the cultivation of the heart, give you certain principles that you can follow, go through the cultivation of the mind, why is it necessary, how do we do it, and then I'm going to give you a few examples of intellectual formation. We're going to talk about God's existence. We're going to talk about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about the supremacy of St. Peter, which is the foundation stone of upon which our claim as Catholics is we are the original Christian church established by Jesus Christ. Does that sound like worth saying for? Does that sound like fun? Say amen for me. Let me know you're awake, okay? All right. So when I say amen, don't be shy to say amen back. As Catholics, we're good at this stuff. If you notice in Mass, that's what we do. We dialogue, right? The Lord be with you. Oh, very good. Y'all got that new translation down and with your spirit. See, we're used to dialoguing. And so as Catholics, don't be shy to dialogue with me. Okay, so let's dive right in with the cultivation of the heart. The, when talking about cultivating the heart for evangelization, it consists of two primary elements. Number one, fostering an interior life. That is intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. And number two, cultivating the virtues of the soul for evangelization. So let's start with reflecting about the importance of cultivating an interior life. That is fostering intimacy with Jesus within the heart. Intimate union with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our Protestant brothers and sisters, rightfully so, often emphasize, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Amen? Andy, can I get an amen on that one? All righty. But you know, as Catholics, in our tradition, we ask, do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus? There's a little bit of a distinction. We can have a personal relationship, but there's a difference between a personal relationship and an intimate relationship between the Lord Jesus and the soul. 
So why is this so important? Number one, the interior life, intimacy with Jesus, is absolutely essential for evangelization because it is necessary in order to bring about the end goal of evangelization. What is the end goal? What is the telos in Greek? The end goal, the final cause, we call it in philosophy, of evangelization. What is, what is it for? What are we trying to bring about? Well, we're trying to bring about an interior conversion. In evangelization, we're trying to bring about an interior conversion of the heart and mind of the person to whom we're speaking. Well, if that's the case, you cannot bring about an interior conversion if you don't first have an interior life yourself. As one author stated that I came across in, in my research and studies, only interior men can produce interior men. You can't give what you don't have. And so intimacy with Jesus is absolutely essential because that's the very thing we're trying to achieve for the other person in evangelization. A personal encounter, an intimate encounter with the living, risen Jesus. Does that make sense? So it's necessary in order to achieve the very end of evangelization. Only interior men can bring about interior men. The second reason why intimacy with Jesus is essential for evangelization is because it makes the proclamation, it makes evangelization the proclamation not of some abstract idea, but it allows evangelization to be the proclamation of an experience which we can actually invite others to enter into and experience themselves. I'm going to repeat that. Intimacy with Jesus is necessary for evangelization because it allows for evangelization not to be simply, not to be a proclamation of an idea, but the proclamation of an experience with a person, which allows for me to invite the other to experience it as well. Remember last night, I mentioned, we spoke about, Pope Benedict XVI had spoke about and written about the importance of the Christian witness and how the Christian witness was indispensable in order that the Word of God would not simply appear as a beautiful philosophy or utopia but that the Christian witness was essential so that the Word of God could literally be seen as something real. Something that could be actualized rather than just some pie in the sky type stuff. Well, this is the idea of intimacy with Jesus as necessary for evangelization. Because when I am intimate with Jesus, when I have that personal relationship, and then I go forth and share that, that witnesses to the person to whom I am evangelizing that this Word of God, this Gospel message, is something that can be lived. And it's not just a way of life or a philosophy like Buddha or Gandhi. But that Christianity is an encounter and a relationship with the person Jesus. And so this is what intimacy and in the interior life does and contributes to evangelization. Pope Benedict XVI, in an address on March 22nd, 2006, taught about this. And he reflected upon the movement of the formation of the apostles within their ministry. He notes how the apostles, before Christ sent the apostles out to evangelize, he willed that the apostles would first have a direct and intimate knowledge of him. He called them to follow him. He said, come live with me. Where do you live, Lord? Where do you stand? Come and see. And they lived with him for three years Christ willed that the apostles had to be with Jesus. 
to experience that intimate relationship with him before they would go out and evangelize. And he goes on to teach us, Pope Benedict XVI does in this address, that, that, that first experience of intimacy with Jesus allowed for their evangelization and their evangelistic endeavors to be not merely a proclamation of an idea, but the proclamation of an experience. And an experience that they could invite others to enter into. That is communio, communion with the Lord Jesus. So there we have the second reason why the interior life is so important for evangelization. It makes evangelization the proclamation not of an idea, but of an experience. That's why intimacy with Jesus is necessary for us as Catholics in the field of evangelization. Third reason why intimacy with Jesus in the interior life is necessary for evangelization, it enables us to work on a supernatural level. The work of evangelization is not a natural thing. The work of evangelization is a, give it to me Catholic folk, supernatural thing. Amen. It's not natural, it's supernatural. And so in order to achieve the mission of evangelization, I have to have the supernatural tools, so to speak. I have to have the supernatural equipment added to my natural powers in order to achieve the end goal of evangelization, which is the conversion of the heart and mind of people to Jesus Christ. If I don't have union with supernatural things, God himself, his grace, faith, hope, charity, if I don't have those things dwelling in my soul, folks, then I am simply working on a natural level. And thus I do not have the supernatural power to do the supernatural work, which is evangelization. Does that make sense? So we've got to have, we've, we've got to foster the interior life. Foster this intimate relationship with Jesus in order to be tapped in to the supernatural order of creation. It's called grace. So that we can achieve the supernatural work of evangelization. So that's some reasons why it's important. How do we cultivate this interior life with Jesus, Carlo? Well, I'll just throw a few principles out at you that you can take very briefly, simply. I don't have much time to dwell upon them to give a whole lesson or a teaching on them. But first of all, personal prayer. Amen? That's a good start. Personal prayer. Well, how do we engage in personal prayer, Carlo? Well, vocal prayer is a start. What is vocal prayer? Vocal prayer is conversing with God using words, whether audibly or inaudibly, formal or informal. That's vocal prayer. Anytime I converse with God using words, Engaging in a conversation with him, that's, in, that's con constituted as vocal prayer. And that conversation can be out loud or not out loud. It can be mentally. I can be using formal words in my conversation with God, such as praying our Father who wart in heaven, right? Or I can be using informal words in my conversation with God. God, you know what? I really need your help tonight so that I can speak well to these people at St. Marcellus. God, I really need your grace so that my bottom there is not hurting on these wooden pews for an hour and a half, right? Because you know the, the head can only take as much as the behind can. You know that, right? <laughs> and so this is vocal prayer. Another way that we can foster this personal prayer life which leads to intimacy with Jesus, is meditation. Meditatio is what we call it in Latin. And what meditation, see this is so important Catholics, you've got to get this. We've got to distinguish between Christian meditation and the world's view of meditation. What is secular society's view of meditation? Hmm, right? Empty your mind. 
empty your mind, right? Free yourself. Well, folks, if you empty your mind, Satan or somebody's going to fill it with something. So for the Christian, meditation is not emptying the mind. In a sense, it's emptying the mind of the things of the world, but filling it with the things of God. So Christian meditation has always been understood as the quest of the mind to seek the how and the why of God's revelation in order that I may find the practical meaning for my life circumstances. The quest of the mind to seek the how and the why of God's revelation in order that I may see the practical meaning in my life. That is Christian meditation, folks. This is one of the rungs or the steps in what is called in our tradition, Lexio Divina, the divine reading. The first stage is oratio in Latin, the reading. You read the text of the sacred words of God. You take the Bible and you read the text and you try to pull out the details. You're gathering the grapes, so to speak. The next stage is meditatio or Christian meditation where you begin to squeeze the juice out of the grapes. That is, you begin to squeeze the meaning out of the details that you found in your reading. And then, in stage three of Lexio Divina, you have oratio, which is Latin for prayer. And that's when we begin to converse with God about the things that I just discovered in the previous two steps. Have you ever had this experience? You sit down to pray and you're like, okay, God, what do we talk about? Ever had that? I know I've had that experience. And so, what's the conclusion? What's the logical conclusion? Well, I ain't got nothing to talk about, so I guess I don't need to pray. Well, Lexio Divinus gives us something to talk about. We read the sacred page, we try to extract its meaning, and then we start to engage in conversation with God about that which I have learned. And then the final stage of Lexio Divina is contemplatio, which is contemplation, which is literally a passive gift of experiencing God that God gives in His own initiative. When He wills it, so we work the first three stages, oratio, meditatio, excuse me, lexio, meditatio, oratio, that's our work, and then God caps it with his grace and his experiential love in contemplatio, which is a pure gift, nothing I can do to work to it. I just simply cultivate the land, right, get it ready, and wait for God to pour forth the rain of grace for the contemplatio. So... Christian meditation is absolutely important to foster intimacy with Jesus Christ. So we got personal prayer life, which consists of vocal prayer and meditation. How about the Liturgy of the Hours? If you ever heard of the Liturgy of the Hours, which is a compilation of the Psalms that the church prays across the world at specific times of the day in order to sanctify the day for the Lord. That's a way that we can engage in personal prayer. The second way that we can foster this uh, intimacy with Jesus is through the devotional life. We got to have a devotional life that's characterized by the Eucharist. Our devotions we, as Catholics needs to be characterized by the Eucharist. Regular attendance of Mass, possibly not just on Sunday, but even during the days of the week if our schedule permits and we have those opportunities. Ordering our life to the Eucharist which is what the church has always encouraged us to do, to be thinking about the primary th event of our week being Mass. So that whatever I think, do, and say should be ordering me toward, gearing me up for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And that way when I come to Mass, I have something to bring to Him and to offer to Him in sacrifice. So we need to have Eucharistic devotions Eucharistic adoration, spending time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, whether he's not exposed in the tabernacle, doors closed, or whether he is exposed in the monstrance. monstrance. Eucharistic adoration, an essential means for us to foster intimacy with Jesus. As Blessed Pope John Paul II once wrote in an encyclical on the Eucharist, he called Eucharistic adoration the school of love. Eucharistic adoration is the school of love. He teaches, he loves us in an intimate way and then he teaches us how to love him in an intimate way in return. 
That's the beauty of Eucharistic adoration. And finally, the last way that we can foster this interior life is practicing the presence of God. What does that mean, the presence of God? Well, it's kind of simple, actually. Think about this. Is there a time during the day when we're not thinking? Literally, no. At any point in the day, try to think about that. You're thinking. And what are we doing when we're thinking? We're dialoguing with ourselves, right? We're having a conversation interiorly. So how about, instead of talking to yourself, <laughs> how about direct the conversation to God? And in so doing, and directing our thoughts throughout the day to God, we are practicing the presence of God. Keeping God's presence at the forefront of our minds, which will help us conduct our, ways, our life in such a way that will be pleasing and worthy of God. Personal prayer life, devotional life, presence of God, three ways that we can cultivate the interior life which cultivates the heart for evangelization. Now, the second element that makes up the cultivation of the heart is that we have to become aware of and begin cultivating the virtues. That is, the temper... Um, the cardinal virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, and then a host of other virtues that flow from those four. And then the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. All of the virtues we have to cultivate as Catholics in order that we can be the evangelists that God is calling us to be. But one virtue in particular that's absolutely essential <coughs> for evangelists I'll be honest with you, that I'm not good at. And so I'm preaching to myself here tonight. I'm reflecting with my brothers and sisters. What is humility? Humility is not being a doormat to be stepped upon. Okay? Humility is the virtue by which, the virtue by which I am able to acknowledge the truth about myself. I repeat, the virtue by which I am able to acknowledge the truth about myself. I'm creature, he's creator. I'm son, he's father. Amen? I acknowledge the truth about myself. And what virtue does is it tempers the mind from deeming myself to be more than what I am. And that's absolutely essential in evangelization because in evangelization, humility helps me keep the focus on God rather than myself. First of all, keeps the focus on God. This is for God's glory. Ad majorum dei glorium, right? For the greater glory of God. That used to be a saying in, in our, our, our retreat group that I used to do with my sister. Ad majorum Dei glorum. Let's try it. I say ad majorum. You say dei glorum. Ad majorum. Ad majorum. For the greater glory of God. Humility uh, enables me to keep that in focus when I'm in the evangelistic endeavor. But further, not only in reference to God, humility enables me to keep the good and the interest of the other first before me. It enables me to keep the good in the interest of the other before myself. St. Paul writes about this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Here's what he writes, quote, Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of of others, end quote. In evangelization, if I have humility, I'm going to be of the mentality that this endeavor, this attempt is for your best interest, not for me to win an argument. Look at me, how sharp I am and persuasively I am intellectually. I got a notch in my belt for another convert. He, the minute I start thinking like that, and trust me, I am tempted to think like that especially in my ministry. The minute I start thinking that, then I've lost the ball game, folks. I've allowed pride to entangle my soul. 
We have to constantly keep the interest of the other at the forefront of our mind in order that we can be successful in evangelization for the glory of God. How do we cultivate the virtue of humility? Well, just a few things real briefly. Number one, we have to remember that we're simply the messenger. And the message that we're portraying and communicating is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. And the messenger is always subordinate to the message. So we're the messenger. And the message is not ours. If we can remember that, that will foster the virtue of humility within the soul. Keeping that in the mind. Secondly, we need to remember, as St. Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think verses 5 through 6, one plants, another waters, and God gives the increase. That's right. We need to remember that we are simply the sower of the seed at times. Or maybe we're the one watering the seed. But the growth and the conversion is the action of grace, folks. And many times, many times, we're not going to see that growth. But we can have hope that the growth will come because God is that powerful. And God promises us that if we be faithful, not necessarily successful, but faithful, that He will bring the increase in His timing. A time when, that we may not see. So if we can remember that, right? That we're simply the sower. We're simply the planter. That will help foster the virtue of humility. Another way to foster the virtue of humility is to remember that we're simply on a journey, folks, of knowledge. And there are times when we might be at a point in our journey of knowledge where we simply just haven't come to know something, right? And so consequently, sometimes I have to say, I don't know. Three very powerful words with the, con with the uh, contraction in there. I don't know. And simply, I just haven't come across a question or that specific knowledge. But once I say, I don't know, what has to follow? I go seek out the answer. Amen? I go seek out the answer because that's a signal grace from God. God allows, I know in my own case, in my own experience, I go on the radio quite often and I, have, I take in live calls with Catholic Answers Lives out of San Diego, Catholic Answers Live out of San Diego, California, and people call in to ask questions about the Catholic faith and I have to shoot from the hip and I have to answer these questions on live radio that spans across the globe via the internet and across the nation even with radio stations and there are many times when I have to say I don't know simply because I've never encountered these questions before in my journey of knowledge in the faith but these are opportunities that God gives me signal graces where God's helping me alone so to speak pushing me forward saying Carlo now I want you to know this and so what a beautiful experience in the evangelistic endeavor. So when we put ourselves out on the line and we start evangelizing folks, we try to start spreading the faith and sharing the faith, I guarantee you, you're going to become a stronger Catholic. Both in the mind and in the heart. Because as we share the faith, as Pope Benedict XVI and John Paul II has taught over and over again, we referenced it last night, when we share the faith, the faith grows stronger within it brings about a vitality, not only within the church, but within our own soul. Now, we move to the cultivation of the mind. When we're talking about the cultivation of the mind, we're talking about forming our intellect in the knowledge of the faith. Forming our intellect with the doctrines and dogmas and the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Now why is this so important? Why is it so important that I should study my Catholic faith and yes, actually go to a Lenten mission? Yes, actually go to a Bible study. Why should I go to a catechism class or adult faith formation class? Mesha, I went to Catholic school for 12 years with the nuns. I even got the scars to prove it. Nobody can teach me anything about that Catholic faith. Man, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard that, I'd be a rich man. 
So why? Why study the Catholic faith? Number one, without intellectual formation, folks, evangelization will be ineffective. Why? Because in evangelization, you have to communicate, number one, what you believe, and number two, why you believe it. St. Peter told us that in 1 Peter 3.15. That's essential to evangelization. Because if I want to persuade the other and lead the other to conversion of the heart and mind to Jesus Christ and Holy Mother Church, well then I got to tell them what Holy Mother Church teaches and I got to tell them why in order to satisfy the intellectual inquiry. Why should I become a Catholic? Why should I believe what you believe as a Catholic? I'm feeling pretty good where I'm at. And so we must have intellectual formation. We must study our faith so that we can be effective in evangelization. Second reason why we must form our intellect and the knowledge of the faith. Without knowing our Catholic faith, it leads to bad argumentation. Argumentation. Like bad reasoning. Here's an example. There are some folks, when talking about the Immaculate Conception, right? Now, if I were to ask you, pop quiz, what is the Immaculate Conception? Don't say Jesus' virginal conception. The Immaculate Conception refers to when Mary was conceived free from the stain of original sin in her mother's womb. Amen? Now, some Catholics, when, when trying to persuade others about that topic, they'll say this. Well, you see, Mary had to be immaculate because Jesus' nature was immaculate. Ever heard of that one? Well, folks, that's bad argumentation. That's false reasoning. The Catholic Church doesn't teach that. Why? Because if you say Mary had to be immaculate because Jesus was immaculate, well, then what about Anne? Right? Well, apparently Anne would have had to be immaculate in order for Mary to be immaculate. And then on and on and on and on. The church teaches it was fitting in the Father's plan to, con to create the mother of his son free from the stain of sin, as St. Thomas Aquinas would tell us. So without such formation, you can actually reason in a wrong way, which can actually hurt the evangelistic endeavor of trying to persuade the other individual, okay? So, that's the second reason. Bad argumentation. Third reason, why we need to study our Catholic faith. And this is probably one of the most important. Without good formation in the knowledge of our Catholic faith, we can actually misrepresent authentic Catholicism. We can actually misrepresent authentic Catholicism. Here's an example for you. The doctrine that the church teaches no salvation outside the church. As taught by par in paragraph 846 to 848, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, taught by popes in centuries past. No salvation outside the church. Now, there are some Catholics who take that doctrine of the church and say and conclude anybody outside the Catholic Church, the visible bounds of the Catholic Church, Protestants, Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, they're all going to hell in a handbasket. Well, that would be a misrepresentation of that particular Catholic doctrine. And then there are some Catholics on the flip side, because the Catholic Church, when it teaches there is no salvation outside the church, as the Catechism explains in paragraph 846 to 848, what she means is anybody who is saved outside the visible bounds, if anybody is saved, they are saved by the grace and truth that comes from the Catholic Church. Anybody who is going to be saved is going to be saved by the grace of Jesus which comes through the mystical body of the church. But that grace is given to them in mysterious ways only known to God, as a, using the phraseology and the imagery of the Second Vatican Council. Now, some Catholics will take that the church says it's possible for somebody to be saved outside the visible bounds of the church. It's possible under certain conditions, and they're important conditions, amen? Somebody will say, well, just be because it's possible for them to be saved, well, then all religions are equal. And all religions are means of salvation. Is that what the church is teaching? No. It doesn't mean all religions. Remember last night, John Paul II stated that the idea of one religion is as good as another is a false theological perspective and the characteristic and a result of a religious relativism. 
So that is not what the church teaches. But you see how without proper formation of the mind and knowing what the church teaches, we can misrepresent authentic Catholicism, folks. And put an idea in the mind of the one we're trying to evangelize, an idea that's not Catholic. You see? So it's very important. I'm talking about some serious stuff here. Fourth reason why we need to form the mind in the Catholic faith. Because without intellectual formation, without good catechesis, you can actually counsel someone into sin, folks. Prime example, artificial contraception. The intentional prohibition, whether before the conjugal act, during the conjugal act, or after the conjugal act, as infallibly taught by Pope Paul VI in 1968, Humanae Vitae, there are some who, whether out of malice or not, just sometimes simply don't know the church's teaching, and there are some who will counsel couples into using artificial contraception as a legitimate means of family planning and spacing children. When the church outright definitively teaches that such an action is objectively, intrinsically evil. Now, whether that person's going to go to hell or not, that's God's business, right? Because we don't know if they have full knowledge and full deliberate consent and whether it constitutes the mortal sin effect in the soul. But we can say, objectively speaking, independent of what they know and choose, objectively speaking, it's wrong. It contradicts God's design for life and love as manifested in the conjugal act. And so there are some, unfortunately, even priests in the confessional, right? And in marriage counseling, encouraging couples to use artificial contraception. How many times have I heard this? Of couples coming and say, well, Father so-and-so said that it would be okay. And so if we don't know our Catholic faith, folks, we could possibly counsel somebody into sin. And so we need to be studying and learning what we believe as Catholics. Now, does this mean, well, I can't evangelize until I know it all. Am I saying that? Absolutely not. Because will you ever know it all? No. But I am emphasizing the importance of studying our Catholic faith. Coming to know what the church teaches. Uh, fourth reason, actually the fifth reason, right? I think I'm on number five. Uh, the fifth reason why intellectual formation is so important is because without it, folks, it can actually cause scandal, which leads someone else to believe that we as Catholics just accept things by blind faith. And that actually contradicts what the church teaches. The church teaches in paragraph 156 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that there are certain motives of credibility for us as Christians to believe in Jesus and what he taught and what he has given us. There are motives of credibility and as the catechism states, in order that our act of faith is by no means a blind impulse of the mind. You see, as Catholics, our faith is not blind faith. It's not faith in the dark, so to speak. Because we have reasonable, foundational principles, motives that show my faith as credible. There are motives that give credibility to what Jesus said and did. Which leads me to put faith in Him. So that my faith is reasonable. It's not just kind of being gullible type, naive type thing. Having somebody shove stuff down my mouth, so to speak, and being brainwashed or whatever as secular society tends to think we're uh, having done to us, right? But I think many times the outside world looks at us as Catholics in such a light. Them dumb Christians, they don't know anything. Because many times as Catholics, we simply say, why do you believe that? I don't know, my mom and my papa taught me that. Why do you believe that? Um, I don't know, the priest said it. Why do you believe that? Well, that's what mom and dad taught me. That's what we always did. And there's nothing wrong. Yeah, the faith got to be passed down. Amen. But as Catholics, we need to become well 
able and ready to articulate our faith and be able to explain it to those who are asking us about it. Listen, I was talking to somebody the other day. At the parish that I'm at in Wenatchee, Washington, there are a lot of converts in that parish. I am overwhelmed at the majority of people who have come from other Christian denominations into the Catholic Church, full of converts. And I was talking to a lady the other day, and she was telling me just how floored she was at how little Catholics knew about their faith when she was on the outside. She couldn't believe it. She literally told me, you Catholics, y'all don't know anything. She's come into the church, but outside the church looking in, she was like, she was floored. Now, that's not to be a condemnation. That's a call to rise up and to answer the challenge and to be the Christians were called to be not only in the heart. We're not only called to have a Catholic heart. We're called to have a Catholic mind. And for the Divine Child Institute, my mission, my goal is to try in some small way to reclaim Catholic sanity. To use the imagery and the language of the late great theologian Frank J. Shee, my favorite we need to reclaim Catholic sanity in order to go with Catholic sanctity. It's a relationship of sanity and sanctity. The mind and the heart. Knowledge and love. That is what we're about as Catholic Christians. We move on. Why should I form my intellect in the knowledge of the faith? It's the commandment of Jesus. Matthew chapter 22 verse 37. Jesus Christ quoting the book of Deuteronomy from the Old Testament but adds a little phrase in there that's not there in the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Did you know the mind is not in the quote from the Old Testament? Jesus inserts the mind in there. And as Blessed Jose, Ma uh, actually Saint now, Jose Maria Escriva would say, if you are called by God to serve God with the mind, then it is a grave obligation to study the faith. Are we called as baptized and confirmed Christians to serve God with the mind? Yes. Jesus said it in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Consequently, therefore, do we have a grave obligation to study our Catholic faith. Yes, we do. Not only is it the commandment of Jesus, St. Peter, as I mentioned last night, our first Pope, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, writes, always be ready to give an answer or a defense to anyone that asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. We've got to be ready to give those intellectual answers, defense, and explanations in whatever capacity that we're in in our life. Granted, we don't all have to be a Dr. Scott Hahn, okay? But wherever we're at, in some way, we need to be able to give those answers as St. Peter said. Not only St. Peter, it's the Council of St. Paul. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. St. Paul writes, Let your speech be gracious, seasoned with Tony Sastris. Well, he doesn't say that, but he says, literally, seasoned with salt. Let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer anyone. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, St. Paul writes, carefully study, hint, study, to present thyself approved unto God. Study to present thyself approved unto God. So what does that mean? Studying, knowing our faith is actually a condition and a requirement for being approved unto God. So carefully study to present thyself approved unto God in order that you may be a workman not worthy of shame, rightly handling the word of truth. We have to handle the word of truth, rightly so. And then finally, we get the counsel of Sirach. Sirach, chapter 8, verse 9. Sirach tells us, do not disregard the discourse of the aged. Do not disregard the discourse of the aged. Right, Lawrence? Lawrence is a wise man. Amen, Lawrence? And I have not disregarded the discourse of Lawrence. Lawrence has been a great friend of mine and given me much wisdom and counsel. 
following the counsel of Sirach. Do not disregard the discourse of the aged. Why? Because through them you will gain wisdom in order that you may know how to answer in the time of need. That's what Sirach says. So what is Sirach telling us? Folks, we've got to study and we've got to learn the discourse of our forefathers. That is the saints, right? The saints in the history of our Catholic faith. The early church fathers. In 107 AD, St. Ignatius of Antioch, a bishop of Antioch, second successor to St. Peter in the Sea of Antioch. That means he was the third bishop of Antioch. Peter was first and then he came third. Antioch... Ignatius writes in 107 AD, only seven years after John the Apostle died, you know what he writes in his letter to the Smyrnians? There are some who abstain from the Eucharist. Why? He writes, because they do not confess, confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of Jesus Christ. And before that, he actually calls such an opinion heterodox opinions, which are opinions that contradict the mind of God. Folks, do you think he was Catholic? Yes! He was! Only seven years after John the Apostle died. So we need to take into consideration the discourse of the age, the discourse of our early forefathers in the faith, which will teach us and give us the wisdom and the means by which we can explain our faith to the world and lead them into union with Jesus Christ. Amen? Practical how-to approach for forming the intellect. Number one, so what are some guidelines that we can take with us to help us to know what we need to study? Well, number one, we need to know the social challenges in society. That is the attacks that come to us as Catholics from the outside. For example, relativism. We mentioned this last night. The common dictatorship of relativism which states there is no absolute truth to which all of us as individuals must conform to and must subject to, but that your subjective opinion is just as good as my subjective opinion, okay? Relativism, no absolute truth. Truth is relative to what you think. Truth is relative to the circumstance alone. Truth is relative to the culture or the society alone, okay? And so we need to learn how to respond to relativism, which basically says this, the only thing that's true is that there is no truth. That's what relativism boils down to. The only thing that's true is that there is no truth. Folks, you ought to be scratching your head right there and saying, man, that don't make sense. Amen? Because it doesn't make sense, folks. It's a philosophy that's self-contradictory, but yet our whole modern society is based upon this self-contradicting principle. So we need to be aware of that. We need to learn how to engage in the modern debate and the modern dialogue with relativism and to show, no, there is an objective truth to which we all must submit and conform to. Second social challenge is what is known as empiricism. Now you might say, what is that? Well, I guarantee you, you're going to know. Empiricism is the philosophy that states the only thing that exists is matter. What I taste, see, touch, smell, feel, weigh. That's all that exists. Spirit, soul, nah, that doesn't exist. All you are is a clump of cells, man. You're nothing more than a blade of grass outside. You just have a few little more evolutionary type stuff going on in you. Few little, a few more uh, molecules sparking in certain ways in you. And your thoughts, just a chemical reactions of, uh, of the chemicals in your brain. That's what empiricism states. We need to learn how to combat that. And say, no, there is something else that exists beyond the material body. There's something spiritual in us. There's something immaterial. We need to learn how to demonstrate the existence that we have a soul, folks. And this leads to the next social problem, the social attack, a bad anthropology, which means there's a false view of the human being, right? In our society, the human being is nothing more than the object to satisfy my own satisfactions, my own desires for satisfaction. There is no value or dignity seen within the human being. The human being is simply an instrument to be used for my own end goals, for my own whims and my own desires. 
And we see this across the board. These are things that we need to try to learn how to combat that goes outside the scope of this talk, but I just want to share with you the social challenges. Another social challenges, challenge is uh, attack on authority, right? The minute, and even among the people sitting in the pews on Sunday, and this is where the new evangelization comes in. When you start talking about authority and how we must obey for the sake of our salvation, the gloves go on. Because we have been duped by secular authority with a, uh, excuse me, secular society with a negative view of authority. Society tells us that authority is negative and repressive. But the true understanding of authority is for the sake of freedom, for the sake of truth, for the sake of happiness. For without that authority, who is over and above our own intellectual judgments, we will lead ourselves to our own destruction, folks, when left to self. So authority is given to us by God for the sake of freedom, for the sake of order, not to be repressive so that I won't be happy. To the contrary, authority is given to us so that we can be happy, to help guide us and orient us true to our true fulfillment, which is in truth, in goodness, in beauty. This is what we're ordered to. And finally, one more social challenge is uh, the, the false understanding of freedom, right? Where you have this sort of moral license idea. I can do whatever the heck I want. Don't you tell me what to do or what not to do. How many of us have ever heard of that one or maybe even thought that one, right? Yeah. And what, what, what's, the common, what's the common objection? What's the common reasoning behind that? I need to be free. Don't tell me what to do. I need to be free. Oh, yeah? Well, go ahead and stand on the top of the building and say that to gravity and say, go ahead, be free and jump off the building and see if gravity doesn't break you. You want to be free? Go ahead, jump off. Exercise your own free will. But what we see there, folks, is that we are not free divorced from law. We are not free separated from law and order. We can only be free in the law. Just like the law of gravity, you can only be free when you live your life in accordance with that law and in that law. Just like with the laws of biology, you can only be free if you live in harmony with those biological laws. Amen? If you starve yourself, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Are you free anymore? No, you're not free to do the things that humans do if you go contrary to your biological laws. So you can only be free in the law. And the same applies to the moral law. How many Catholics sitting in the pew say, church needs to get out my bedroom, the church needs to get out my life and stop telling me what to do and what not to do? Why do they say such a thing? Because they have a false idea of freedom. They do not see the reality that they can only be free in and through the law that God has given us. A law that is literally the instruction manual of how the human being is supposed to function in order to achieve what it's meant to achieve. Happiness. Could you imagine somebody going buy a new 2012 Chevrolet truck, take the instruction manual, and the instruction manual said, do not put oil in gas tank. How dare they tell me what to do? I want to be free. They're repressing my freedom. I'm going to put oil in the gas tank. Is that truck going to run? No. They're not going to be free to drive the truck, right? And that's what the moral law is, the Ten Commandments, and what the Holy Mother Church teaches in her moral teachings, in morality. That these moral laws are meant to be given to us in order that we can be free and not destroy ourselves. <laughs>